We're going to explore blue and green business opportunities and see uh, how we can explore and identify potential business opportunities in the end of this uh, fall with the workshop that you are all invited to uh, join later on in, uh, in this fall. Today we are going to uh, hear from uh, different uh, presenters. Uh, we're going to meet uh, Maria Halsengren, Edvard Sims, Rob Donsky, Alexander uh, F. Uh, Christiansen from A, and also Evin Fillingen Jensen from Nofima. We're going to tell you a little bit more about them as we go along in this uh, webinar. But first of all, we're going to hear some uh, few thoughts about uh, blue and green uh, opportunities from the cluster uh, that are uh, coordinating this um, event. It's the NC Blue Legacy, NC Heidna and NC Seafood Innovation. Maria Halsengren, you're going to lead on here. Um, thank you, Nina, and um, welcome to everybody uh, again. Um, we have with us uh, Nina Stangelan, Managing Director of um, uh, NC Seafood, Venke um, Oxenøy, uh, Managing Director of NCE Blue Legacy, and Christiane Hugberg, NCE Heidner Biocluster. As this, as, as this webinar, um, this and the following three webinars, um, are, the, are a part of an innovation process you have started. Um, I would like to ask you, Christiane, how did this program, uh, Land Meets Ocean, start? And, uh, and what have you done uh, leading up to today? Yeah, I would like to answer that because this, is, this has been an exciting journey. NC Blue Legacy, NC Seafood Innovation and NC Heidner Biocluster together with Biotech Nord, have for the last three years collaborated on how to innovate and create valuable business from innovation across blue and green sector. And this has resulted in a large number of ideas and that has been discussed at earlier conferences the two previous years. And, uh, and Nina, from, um, from your point in, in NC Seafood Innovation, uh, what do you think the value of the cooperation between these uh, three um, food industries um, uh, could give Norway? Uh, this is uh, a result of uh, the knowledge that we know that the resources are limited and also that is a case in the blue grain uh, industry that we all are represented uh, here today. The principles of uh, circular economy gives us a mindset to upcycle as a result uh, transform waste to, to resources. Uh, by exploring this uh, possibility between blue and green food industry, we believe that this will be able to help us identify new business opportunity for our industries and our cluster here in Norway. Uh, and that's the motivation behind this project. And uh, Venke from, uh, from Blue Legacy, um, why are these uh, clusters relevant to, to address value creation across blue and the green sector? Well, uh, our three clusters, we represent all parts of the blue-green value chains and we have actually quite broad experience in cross-sectorial uh, collaboration. So, and we also get feedback from our members on the knowledge gaps uh, and also hurdles to reach the existing potential. So we hope that this webinar series, or we, we think really that this webinar series is, is core in how we can work together to build more, more value in this field. And, uh, and Nina, what do you think would be the, the value of upcycling if you could identify opportunities for upcycling? resources um, through this process? I think we all here share that it's a win-win situation. Uh, upcycling is when you are able to use, uh, in our uh, case, uh, bio products in a new area uh, or a form that is more uh, valuable. This will give us uh, not only an uh, increase in the value of the byproduct, but it will also contribute to positive externalities like reducing the carbon footprints 
and uh, the demand for production of new ingredients and uh, and products when uh, when we see that it's all about the limited resources that we're facing. And uh, and what do you think, Christiane? Uh, uh, on top of that, what could the green and blue sectors learn from each other? Well, we truly believe that uh, the innovation degree we could achieve working across uh, this sector is uh, higher than what we can achieve working only in on our own sector. So, as I mentioned, we have in earlier seminars heard a lot of interesting ideas from our companies. And in order to develop some of these ideas, cross the company cooperation is necessary. So. Therefore, this year we aim first to, uh, to find interesting space in, for innovation through the webinars and thereafter work with selected business ideas. So it will be very exciting. And, uh, and to follow up on that, uh, Vanke, uh, when we select uh, the business ideas, what's your goal, uh, end goal for the land meets ocean work stream this year? Well, it has it has actually been touched upon, but um, to make it simple, we want this work stream that we're now starting to end up in very specific innovation projects with participants from both aquaculture, fisheries and agriculture sector. Uh, and after this series of webinars, uh, we will send to all participants a quest back and we encourage you to submit your business ideas that you get hopefully during this webinars. Um, and we will thereafter single out these ideas and work with EI's innovation methodology in order to end up with pilots or new applications or projects to be included in our members' innovation pipeline. That's the, really the hope that we, we hope to achieve. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and then we're um, uh, then I'm uh, happy to, to introduce um, uh, Edward Sims, uh, who is uh, who is uh, leading our circular economy and sustainable uh, sustainability team in uh, in EY, and has been working on how to achieve circularity and how to um, develop business models, sustainable business models, and industries in a number of regions and countries around the world. So, um, so welcome, Edward. Hello. Um, I will just share my presentation as well just show that. let me know when you can see it can you can you hear me okay yeah excellent so I will start I will start presenting first of all it's a pleasure to be here so um, as Maria said I'm leading for EY on uh, circle economy based in Belgium but working globally with clients on circle economy issues so it's a pleasure to be speaking with you uh, with colleagues based in Norway today so first of all, I just want to start with the, let's say, the circular economy imperative. Why investors, why global leaders, um, why actors such as the OECD, the G7, um, the UN, what, what is the importance of circular economy? So it is um, really this imperative to form a more inclusive form of capitalism, to really embed sustainability within, uh, within capitalism, to change the way we we're making things from the current linear economy to, to the more circular economy and we see um, circular economy as a concrete way a concrete way to address some of these let's say global um, challenges global challenges uh, with the present present system and not just us but major corporates major global leaders see circular economy as one of the ways we can address some of the major challenges such as the UN SDGs but also climate change um, other issues in terms of employment etc cetera, etc cetera. So let me just explain a bit. And I know we've got the, the colleague Alexander, who has done a very detailed work on circle economy in Norway, who is speaking later. So we'll also hear from him. I will just give more, let's say, more top level, more international perspective on circle economy. As a lot of the colleagues on the call um, today probably already know, so circle economy transitions from the current way of making things, um, uh, using things and throwing them away to um, keeping the material, keeping the value in the loop. So when we make things, we use it and then we can find another use for it. Um, we can repurpose it, reuse it, keep it in the loop and reconsume it again. So it's it's really in essence, keeping value in the loop rather than destroying value from, from creating waste, from creating environmental problems, from creating carbon, really keeping that, that, that value in the loop. Um, so this is just 
an example slide here. So the circular economy waste hierarchy. So what we really want to do in the circular economy is move away from thinking about waste to have a resource. So what's interesting for, for industry as well is that waste is a problem, but it's also a cost. So it's a regulatory problem and it's a cost to dispose of that waste. If you can design out that waste, think of innovative ways for using, reusing, preventing, recycling um, that waste, you're also moving up the scale here. You're generating more revenue. You're, and you're also reducing your cost to your, to your processes from actually producing that waste and disposing of that waste uh, in the first place. One of the best things to do is obviously to change consumer behavior um, and to change business behavior and stop the creation of waste in the first place. But that is very difficult to do. That requires change in behavior. Um, I'll move on here. So just to give you, let's say, a high level uh, overview of what's going on in circular economy in the world, why circular economy is being driven by policymakers. It's obviously been driven by industry as well, but some of the key um, actions on, on policy. So you will probably be quite familiar with that. The EU is doing work on circular economy. There's a circular economy action plan. There's many um, pieces of EU legislation on waste management, eco design. And some of that has an impact, obviously, on Norway, um, as you're associated with the EU. But there's also been action in, in countries like Canada on zero plastic waste, on provincial extended producer responsibility. There's been action in places like Japan on uh, material flow management, action in China. So this uh, circular economy is embedded in Chinese legislation. There's also circular economy forms one part of the current five year Chinese um, economic plan and also around Europe. So various countries like France, UK, Germany have all been very active on, on the circular economy. And as well as uh, these sort of legislative drivers, we're also seeing um, our, our, our view is that um, circular economy can be uh, a major, let's say, concrete corporate response to some of the, the major societal challenges such as climate change, um, UN sustainable development goals. So for instance, on climate change, uh, countries, but also companies need to re reduce their overall carbon emissions, their CO2 emissions. Some of the, let's say, concrete um, circular economy processes can help you to achieve these macro things. For instance, instead of buying a new engine, you might remanufacture your engine in, in your fishing boat, etc. And that not only does it save the raw material um, used to, to produce that engine in the first place, but um, you're also um, uh, saving um, stopping the, that that old engine becoming waste. So you're, you're achieving a double thing. And in terms of SDGs, um, I mean, circular economy can help with a lot of the SDGs, especially on responsible consumption production, but also on, on other SDGs. I mean, it can also be, circular economy can also help with um, job creation and uh, local jobs that can't be uh, delocalized, can't be moved out of Norway, for instance, in, as I was mentioning, the remanufacturing sector. So that's when you, you repair pieces of equipment. It's usually done locally because the logistics change, um, logistics change don't make, make it viable to take that material back to China, have it repaired in China and bring it back. No, it's usually done uh, locally um, in the market in question. Um, and then that creates uh, skill, skill jobs with uh, added value. So just to, and then just bringing back to why, why circular economy, why sustainability, what are your consumers, what are global consumers thinking about the issue of um, circular economy, sustainability? So more and more consumers um, are looking at how companies behave. Are they, and they're thinking, do companies put, um, you know, values such as sustainability, um, people above profit? So a lot of, and this is also drive, importantly for you guys, it's also driving the sales to the consumer. So um, EY has recently done a global um, survey um, and we on consumer attitudes to sustainability circular and we see that um, a lot of um, consumers are seeing 42% of survey respondents are seeing sustainability is increasingly important when out shopping so that's driving their, their purchasing decision and importantly also for thinking about circular thinking for added value 31 percent of respondents said they would be willing to pay more so they'd be willing to pay a premium for goods that are more sustainable uh, more sustainable services as well and 22 percent of respondents said that sustainability would, would be one of their uh, primary purchase criteria over the next five uh, years so um, a fifth of all consumers so you really see that sustainable sustainability and thinking about how to embed sustainability in the products and services you offer um, is important to you going forward as your unique selling point to how to differentiate yourself from other companies um, how to um, attract more customers but also retain existing customers etc 
And just, just to, to give you a sort of high level overview here of what we've seen, so working globally with corporates, but also governments, we've also worked with the European Commission, what are some of the values um, drivers that, that are driving businesses around the world to adopt um, more circular economy uh, business practices? So we're seeing cost and compliance. As I mentioned, there's a lot of legislation coming up in relation to waste management, circular economy, um, eco design, etc. But also, um, circle economy can help you um, mitigate costs. So raw material costs, volatility of raw materials, access to raw materials. Um, thinking, thinking more circular process can also help you reduce costs in your business. So reduce waste, which is a cost, reduce energy loss, which is a cost, and also help you um, mitigate, help you come up with a strategy to, to mitigate upcoming legislation, which might, be, um, might affect your business negatively. So also, as I said, mentioned in the previous slide as well, Another driver for circular economy within your business is climate, uh, meeting client expectations. So as I mentioned, there was that EY survey showing that sustainability is really a driver with, with clients. And the circular can also help you meet your UN uh, sustainable development goals, certain of those. It can help you deal with the upcoming challenges, as I mentioned, resource scarcity. So there's uh, more and more people in the world, the re resources are scarce. As as the emerging middle class, there's, there's less resource to go around and also one of the macro challenges you'll all be aware about is, is climate change and some of the circular processes can help you concretely uh, tackle climate change as a country but also as a as a business as well and circular economy can also help you with thinking about new business solutions so new business models um, maybe product service solutions um, or digitally enabled business models as well so circular economy can be enabled by digital tools as well but also, but also um, some business models may, may be um, allowed by some circular business models may be favored by um, digital tools such as uber airbnb we would we would say these models are quite quite uh, circular because they're sharing resources uh, sharing scarce resources and the digital technology allows you to do that so there might be digital technology that could be useful for, for your sectors as well and also consumer we're also seeing as we mentioned consumer preference for, for greener products consumer preference for, for more circular products as well and within a company um so we're seeing greater investor pressure for greater sustainability, um, investor pressure for moves to um, moves to, moves to circular, for moves to circular, and also how is your business thinking about long-term value? So uh, thinking circular can also embed that long-term value uh, within your business, and also the employees themselves. So the employees themselves they might often have um, they they'll be thinking about sustainability showing that your company is doing something on circular can really uh, both attract younger employees, the younger generation, but also um, retain employees who are concerned about sustainability and circular. So just um, just a final thing. So I just want to highlight some of the these business models so that there are um, uh, so five. So the OECD has come up with um, five um, circular economy business models. These are just general types of business models, and we can see so the circular supply models, resource recovery models, product life extension, sharing product system service models. So, for instance, on product system service models, this might be that your company produces a certain thing. It might um, produce fishing nets, and rather than selling the fishing nets um, to the um, to your to your end client, it might. Um, retain ownership of fishing nets and lease these fishing nets to your client on a monthly on a daily basis and you would retain ownership of the fishing nets um, and you would also uh, manage the fishing nets you know uh, make it, repair them as necessary on product life extension models so instead of um, I don't know selling selling an engine that can only last uh, five five years you might um, sell an engine that will last uh, 10 years so it has gr greater durability greater um, value for your for yourself you can sell it more but also greater durability because it lasts more for 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 the client and um that that so this is just a little bit about me it's been a pleasure to speak with you i'm happy to take questions in the chat afterwards thank you back to you uh, maria uh, now it's uh, over to uh, rob uh, do uh, Dongoski, who is uh, uh, EY's uh, global agriculture lead and uh, has been working with food systems and agriculture and aquaculture and fisheries um, for a long time. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Maria. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, present this morning. Um, I did share my screen. Hopefully that transition came over okay. 
so just quickly, I'll go through a platform that we call Next Wave uh, Food System Reimagined, which is really the convergence. We've been studying the convergence of macro trends in the economy, like population growth, like rising middle class, as well as the advancement of, of key technologies like blockchain, IoT, AI, you know, all, all the all the technology. Pr the premise being that technology will never move slower than it's moving today. So we're just going to keep pick, picking up pace with technology. And we, we believe that the food system is at a, a you know, a tipping point of uh, transformation. So let me hit a, just a couple of these just to give you a sense. This is a pretty large document. So I'm just going to hit a couple high points given the, uh, the time constraints this morning. Um, one of the one of the trends that are impacting consumers in, in general, two two things really, technology solutions like subscription services, um, sensors, ability to connect, and then and privacy is enabling lifestyle platforms where you can be more sustainable, you know, beyond just recycling, but focus on food waste and um, and, and live a, a lifestyle that's more based on your values. And so we see you know an increase in in certain types of food choices based on on that. And then the last one is really health and well-being, you know, this convergence of food and health and what does that mean? And I'll, I'll show in a second some of the investment numbers on on the differences. But, you know, how do we you know, co-mingle our, our nutrition, our health, you know, beyond just basic sustenance that uh, that we've seen in the past? And it ultimately, just, this creates platforms of, of how we live, whether it's eat, play, work, you know, in that co-mingling again of, of all those coming together is important. Um, Edward mentioned some of the future consumer index material that we've recently done. We've been studying the food system for, for the last several years. And, you know, a couple of things that really start to pop out, you know, this shift towards alternative proteins, whether that means, you know, a plant-based protein, a cultured uh, protein, or a fermented protein, that the shift here is, is dramatic and expected to continue. And then the other is you kind of work your way down short ingredient index. The, 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 the real trend here from future consumer index that we, we conducted, 65% of consumers are going to shift their diets to more fresh food going forward, whether that's fruit and veggies or fresh proteins. But the shift is on. And in the short ingredient index, that means you know consumers are ultimately looking for foods that have five ingredients or less on the label. You know, and so you know, one is best and five is uh, about as far as they want to go going forward. And as you work your way through this stack of, of examples here, you'll see functional ingredients, you know, ingredients in food that's beyond just texturants or flavorings, you know, or colorants, but you also see now for very specific nutritional supplements, you know, things like spirulina that, you know, is, you know, clearly a, a you know, significant protein supplement in, uh, in the, the system right now. And then we also see this, you know, emergence of targeted diets, you know, where, you know, whether that's the paleo, keto, uh, low carb, what, what have you, how do those diets manifest in, uh, in food choice as well? So those are just a couple high level. Let me, let me scan back here a little bit, give you a sense of um, one of the things that we've kind of developed is something we call the paradoxes of food and ag. And if you just, I won't go through these in the interest of time, but, you know, ultimately today, a couple that I'll highlight, big, big food is on the down and small foods on the rise. And that really goes back to those short ingredient decks. You know, consumers really want to shop at the perimeter of the store or inside a fresh store or even better, right at the producer's table. You know, so want to get food right from the producer is, is the, the goal right now. Um, the other one in here, we, today we spend more money to fix people than feed people. When you look at the, the pharmaceutical R&D numbers compared to food R&D, you know, we're talking about a 10x multiple. So 10 times more money to fix people than feed people. That trend line is starting to change, but we still have a ways to go. The other one is we, we're in a, with rising middle class, rising incomes, there's a desire to upgrade diets to more protein, but at the same time leave a smaller carbon footprint. And so how do we do that? The emergence of plant-based proteins and alternatives certainly give rise to that, but we do have to have different practices on farm in order to ultimately impact this, this paradox. And the last one I'll just mention is that personalization versus scale. In most countries, we've got a food system that's really driven in design more for scale and what consumers are really emerging as is, is looking for personalization. And so when you think about the future of you know, wearing a, a watch, 
knowing your, your genetic makeup, and then also being on a, a diet for a certain purpose, you blend those all together and you, you end up having a very personalized dining experience to meet certain goals. And so that's that's just some of the paradoxes that are driving a driving behavior across the chain. Let me scan over just real quick. I'll sh give you a sense of, um, you know, th this 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 mural that I'm going through is quite large, and there's lots of click throughs that we won't be able to go through today. But what what we're trying to depict and is on the far left, you see, you know, a lot of traditional protein sources. You know, whether it's dairy or or uh, traditional meats, you know, those those traditional systems are evolving very, very quickly, but it's also given rise to some of the alternative systems, you know, that we see in the upper right, you know, in the shift of, you know, sea-based uh, aquaculture to land-based aquaculture, and how does that, how does that shorten the supply chain potentially? How does, how do we make that, you know, operate at the scale that's needed? And then the the other one that ultimately think where are consumers shopping? Clearly in COVID we've seen that shift. We think it'll snap back to, to previous levels, but not quite not quite to the exact same, uh, exact same level. So the eat at home experience on a global basis will will continue to, to increase um, due to some of the experiences that people had during COVID. But what we're anticipating is at the grocery level we're shopping is we see a separation of the grocery store from Things are in the center of the store, typically processed or things in a bag, box, or a can. We see that moving to a dark store environment that, that can be ordered online or, or you know, uh, click and collect, where what's left is, is really a live store format, which is really where consumers are shifting their diets towards. And so that's a, that, 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 that's a concept we think will continue to, to uh, play out in the industry. Let me close with a, a couple things on innovation. You know, on the far left, what you see is what the way we just describe innovation in the food and agriculture area is really around four dimensions, and they're not mutually exclusive. So mechanical things like you know robotics and and automation, um, the science area, whether it's you know um, biological seed treatments or um, CRISPR and and other other novel technologies coming on, technology and data, which is really all the things on the bottom of this chart around 3D printing and automation and digital and genetics and so forth. And then ultimately business models and a few business models that, that I would highlight that we think are, are ultimately really starting to move the needle. You know, we're seeing a shift to more outcome based. So, you know, and like in the seed industry, in the, in the row crop industry, that we're not just selling seeds and chemicals to put in the ground, but actually providers are selling an outcome and they're selling a profit per acre, they're selling something like a disease-free wheat, a field, versus here's the chemicals you need to put on that field. Um, you know, other business models we see is subscription-based services. You know, we have, you know, certain shops now is, you know, pay a certain amount per month to get all the coffee you want, or or what, you know, diff different areas like that. The experience of omni-channel, consumers want to buy what they want to buy and wherever they want it. They want the same experience, whether it's online or in-store. And the last one I would say is just around the, the area of controlled environment agriculture. You know, with the efficiency of um, energy, efficiency of lighting and the HVAC systems, uh, we, you know, we're seeing that controlled environment becomes a, a, a very real opportunity in this in this marketplace, you know, to use less chemicals, to be more sustainable in our practices, then ultimately shorten the supply chain from those producing food to those consuming food. The one area I would highlight that I, I don't see on a on a, a regional or even a global basis of as much investment going into innovate is the area of food waste. And food waste post meal and food waste post production are the two areas to really, really target. And I think that's an area of innovation that is is really yet to be cracked in the uh, in the um, in the grand scheme of things so with that i'm going to close and pass it over to alexander who i believe is um, going to present the results of some of his work thank you very much um can you see my screen maria in presentation mode yes Perfect. 
Thank you very much for the introduction and it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Alexander Christensen and I'm working for a company called Circle in Norway. And we have been doing a study of the Norwegian economy together with a Dutch company called Circle Economy. And the big question we raised is, can we measure circularity? And this is a question that was raised by a number of leading businesses within Norway, where they asked the question, can we measure how circular the Norwegian economy is? And what should we then do in order to close the circularity gap? So uh, the Norwegian government are very ambitious. They want to be a front runner within circularity. And then it makes sense to have a look at what's happening on the global level and what's happening on a European level. So here you can see that the assessment that Circle Economy of a partner did of the global economy, stating that the global economy is about 9% circular. This is an analysis that has been performed the last three, year, three years and it are presented during the World Economic Forum in Davos. And they have also been uh, done work with selected countries in Europe. So then the question is how circular are Norway? And every uh, country has a different starting point and every country is unique. So how circular is Norway then? The Norwegian economy is 2.4% circular. That means only 2.4% of what we are using every year to satisfy our societal needs is going back to the economy again. Or on the flip side of this, the Norwegian economy is more than 97% circular. And that is the, the Norwegian circularity gap. And I said that the Norwegian government are ambitious. We want to be a front runner within circularity. By the end of this year, the Norwegian government will put forward a, a strategy for circularity within Norway. But when I present a number like this, we need to know what's behind this number and What's the state, uh, what's characterized the Norwegian economy today and what can we do in order to move forward? And here you see the methodology that Circle Economy has developed. Circle Economy has been working together with leading universities, leading businesses and organizations in Europe in order to measure circularity on a global level and on a national level. So for simplicity, this is the three steps where we are using state-of-the-art data from Statistical Norway, from Waste from Norway, and an international database on macroeconomics data called Exeobase. But in essence, it's about how are we linking resource consumption to societal needs? And the resources, we are dividing them into four different groups. It's about fossil fuels, metal ores, minerals, and biomass. Then we are looking at how much are we using every year to satisfy the societal needs within Norway, including housing, communication, mobility, healthcare, services, consumables, and nutrition. So when we know how much we're using every year, and we know how much that are circling back to the economy again, yeah, then we are in a position to estimate the circularity gap. And when we have that in place, we can say something about what should, the, what kind of strategies can we choose? What kind of pathways can we take in order to become more circular? And this is the material footprint of the Norwegian economy. This is an X-ray of the Norwegian economy showing 
material use and the material footprint. This might look a little overwhelming, but let us take it very closely, step by step. And let's start down in the left hand corner where you see the extraction of resources domestically in Norway. You see the four resource groups that we are extracting and they are flowing from the left hand to the right hand side, side to satisfy the societal needs. And then they go through different steps of the economy. First, it's about extraction. Then it's about how we are refining those resources in order to make products to be divided into the different societal needs. And Norwegian economy is a small open economy. And we know that we are exporting a lot. And you see how resources are extracting, flowing up to the right hand corner out of the Norwegian economy again. And we are, ex of course, exporting a lot of oil and gas that are colored blue here, but we are also exporting a lot of minerals, metals and biomass. Keep in mind that here we are talking about megatons. So it's the mass we are measuring here. But looking at the Norwegian economy, we also see that we are importing a lot. So we are making a very high material footprint in other countries that are used to satisfy the Norwegian societal needs. But we also should know that we are building up, up a lot of stocks when things are used here in Norway and a very little is cycled back into the economy again. That's the reason, reason we are 2.4% circular. And if you're looking at this picture, it's just a perfect linear economy that are more than 97% linear. So how are we moving to a more circular economy? We have been exploring different what-if scenarios related to key sectors within the Norwegian economy, including energy, construction, transport, food, forestry. And when we have been developing these different what-if scenarios, we have been using seven strategies from the circular economy. And four of three of these uh, strategies are going directly on the material flow itself. And that relates to prioritizing regenerative resources, preserve what you already have there, and use material as a resource. But there are some enabler strategies that we also can use. And that's about how are we designing for a circular economy? How about we rethinking our business model and incorporate digital technology? And the core of all is about how are we then collaborate to make this happening? And one of these scenarios, as I indicated, is related to circular food systems. And in this what if scenarios, we are assuming all food waste to be eliminated, for example, using digital technology to help that process. And the material intensity of fishing and aquaculture should be a responsible source and biomass should also be a responsible source, for example, through different certification schemes. And for all these different scenarios, we are able to improve the circularity metric and reduce the material footprint. But the big benefit is coming when we are harnessing cross-intervention synergies, running these different scenarios together. Then we are able to improve the circularity metric to about 46% and really slashing the material footprint of the Norwegian economy and really reducing the carbon footprint. And within those scenarios, there will be a change and there will be really opportunities. And of course, those opportunities will come within new jobs and new requirements for different skills. And 
here we see the change makers winning Norway are the businesses, governments, and the unions that can facilitate the process of making the skills we need for this transition into a more circular economy. And we need to focus on that this needs to be a just transition that really taking care of the worker themselves. And we need to use updated information on sectoral levels. And finally, we've been also looking at the consumer and the consumptions that are the center of the change. And they, with businesses and governments, they can facilitate this circular consumption to a better understanding, awareness and action with having the end users in mind. So with that, I hope this project and what we've done here can facilitate a nice discussion on a, a local level by governments, but also by businesses. So then over to Maria. So then I think it's Avin Filling Jensen's. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just one second and, and then I'll uh, have my slide up. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the inv invitation to talk about the future of food production, which is not necessarily only linked to circularity, but it's uh, certainly areas of the overall challenge that uh, the globe is uh, facing. So the next few minutes I will uh, use to give you uh, some of the overviews of some of the challenges that we are facing and also some of the opportunities in the interaction between uh, blue and green and some of the topics has already been mentioned uh, during the previous presentations. I think there is uh, one very important picture to remember that uh, ocean represents 71 percent of the global surface land only 29 percent but if we are to produce enough food for an increasing population and urbanized population in an area under climate change and um, uh, uh, land degradation and so forth more will have to be in the interaction between land and ocean uh, I think it's important to remember, and we, it was mentioned here, the youth uh, activities linked to food production is actually estimated to be around a third of the total greenhouse gas emissions. And that is something that we have to deal with in the climate change challenge. In addition to that, food waste, food loss, and there is uh, two sides of food waste. The, it's in developing countries, the pre-market, pre-access to consumer, and in the con uh, developed world, post-purchase, uh, post-consumption waste, and both has to uh, be addressed. Uh, it's important to remember that improvements in the f way we produce f uh, food has always uh, been imposed by efficiency from the old uh, hand labor to the more modernized tractors or as you see uh, the current uh, agricultural shift being digitized using sensors, using facial recognition for uh, better pr uh, production, using robots or um, automates, vertical farming, city farming, and so forth. And all these parameters together will uh, influence the way food is being produced, uh, produced in the future. What you also see is then one technology that has been applied in, for instance, agriculture is very fast and uh, very rapidly inter, uh, entering into seafood and aquaculture production. So the aquaculture production is moving from uh, what we know in Norway, the Mari culture, but I can have shown similar picture from land-based facilities, uh, in, from using ponds to what you see down in the left-hand corner here, more modern large-scale land-based productions, or where you also see digitized uh, disease detection or remote feeding stations where you're able to collect and uh, 
large uh, number of data that can be used to improve your production system. Also in the fisheries, the use of analytics, improved fishing technologies, uh, the ban on waste and the ban on uh, in utilizing everything which is taken on board a ship is uh, a key. Modern trawlers, they have onboard circular uh, facilities so that they utilize not only the uh, fillets, but also the bones and the heads and the skin and everything is being processed on board in bioreactors to high valuable protein, so nothing is being lost. The consumers is a key driver. Health and well-being and natural food has been mentioned as one of the key drivers. On the other hand, convenience, availability or food on the go is a uh, very important part. The way we eat and the way we snack and taste, indulgence and pleasure and feelings. But what we see now in uh, the global change of food production is that the concern for the climate and the environment, animal welfare, and sustain, uh, sustainability in general, that means both economic, social and environmental sustainability is becoming forefront and it's been driven by the consumers that demand more sustainable products in the future. And th this means that the food systems was explained in the previous slide, but they are vulnerable. It's not only to start and to say, well, we will reuse, recirculate and reduce, but we have to look at the whole chain, uh, chain from logistic, uh, primary production through logistics, transport, processing, marketing, distribution, preparation, consumption. And we have to look at the legal and the regulatory issues if we are to use food waste, for example, and we have to have uh, adapt and um, relevant research environments that are catering to the changes in the food systems. If we do a small shift, there are some trend, major trends that we are uh, seeing and they are driven by the, uh, uh, the drivers that I showed on the previous slide. That is climate change, it's environmental impact, it's animal welfare and it's resource utilization. First of all, plant-based food, uh, food is a key major driver. Today, the plant-based food is ch challenging everything from dairy industry uh, with uh, plant-based drinks and plant-based um, uh, products, plant-based ice cream. We have plant-based eggs, we have plant-based seafood, we have uh, beef without beef, plant-based beef. So this is a key driver and the market is expected to grow from approximately 1 billion today to around 10 billion in 20, uh, 140 billion US dollars. And the growth is extremely rapid, which also tells you that it's interesting to investors who want to capture some of the growth in that market. One of the major drivers behind is the climate impact of meat production uh, for um, plant-based meat substitutes. It's lower water consumption, less use of land, low use of energy and lower emission of greenhouse, gas, uh, greenhouse gases. And it was mentioned by the previous speaker that energy and energy cost is also one part of the circular equation. But the, uh, the fight is on uh, and meatless farms are using quite aggressive uh, marketing tools to put their products in the place. A second trend is grab uh, lab grown meat and instead of having the traditional life cycle of a cow from cattle breeding and the whole way out to meat on your plate, which takes about uh, two years, you are now seeing uh, a lot of initiatives with alternative cell-grown meat where you take use stem, uh, stem cells from animal and propagate those cells into uh, muscle cells, into um, blood cells, into fat and into cartilage or to 
uh, connective tissue. And then you use these uh, cell mixtures in 3D printers or in scaffold technologies to produce meat uh, that can be uh, put to the market. Today, the prices are prohibitive, but the prices will uh, come down as this moves forward. You see the same th thing in the seafood sector. Uh, it's unfortunately the headline of the slide, but there's a lot of companies uh, putting their emphasis on alternative seafood. And if you take the column where I have lined, uh, outlined with some colors, these are both uh, plant-based or algae-based or a combination. It's seaweed, but it's also cell-grown and it's uh, using traditional um, uh, vegetable proteins like soy or peas or uh, microalgae. In addition to that, the number of investors, professional investors with an agenda for sustainability and for circular economy is increasing and in is putting mega money into these alternative initiatives as they are in plant-based food. And if you take a look at uh, in investors, how they are looking at uh, these products, and here is a comparison between the development of seafood companies and Beyond Meat in the, um, during the uh, period of uh, COVID-19. The negative side for traditional meat producers is quite high. That's on the right-hand slide. And uh, the development of Beyond Meat shares is quite positive. And the number of products already on the market, be it uh, substitutes from uh, from vegetables or from uh, others are increasing. This uh, this picture in the food production system and uh, the way food, uh, food is being produced and perceived is changing the way we will shop in the future. A th uh, fourth uh, initiative is using insects. Today, more than 2,000 different species uh, are being used, being um, beetles or larvae, uh, larva from soldier fly or uh, bees or wasps or grasshoppers or uh, cicadas or others. And it's more than 3 million uh, to 4 million people around the world who has insects as their main protein source. These insects are being dried and they have a high content of uh, vitamins. They have a high content of uh, uh, fat and minerals. So they are fully able to substitute and uh, support traditional uh, products. In the future, one of the key drivers is to make products similar to meat. I do personally not believe that people will eat more carrot, even though the green is uh, uh, five a day is a slogan. But I think what you will see is that a shift towards products that are similar to products we know from uh, or uh, the way we grew up is uh, increasing and the lab grown meat is something that we will still have to wait some years to see. Last but not least, there are uh, modern technology. Single cell based protein or protein from thin air is uh, or precision fermentation is one of the key new areas where a lot of money is being put into food production to see if we are able to make new products, new uh, foods by using already existing technology. Fermentation is nothing new. It has, we have been brewing beer for more than 3000 years. So it's no understanding the cell and the cell behavior with in-depth biological knowledge combined with technology that makes this possible. And then gene technology, gene editing like CRISPR-Cas9 or others uh, uh, like GMOs will be a part of the solution for the future. Still, I return to my statement. 
the legislative side is important, as is the uh, need for uh, research and development. And it's also a matter of the willingness, the consumer's willingness to pay and consumer acceptance. You see this in the area of aqua feed, uh, where you have algae or fr uh, from wood, or you have it from uh, uh, tunicates, and then you open up a whole new area of food production. So there is a, a little uh, take home message. Population growth, urbanization, climate change and consumer behavior will lead to changes in the uh, future of food production. All steps are undergoing technology shifts. Digitalization, automation, robotization, gene technology, alternative protein sources and new formulation technology will become mainstream. So what is uh, mainstream today is redundant tomorrow and we will see plants, lab grown meat, insects, algae and so forth entering the food space. Gene technology, precision fermentation, single cell proteins is developing fast and circular economy, sustainability and traceability is key. Thank you very much. And the word goes to uh, Nina. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Even uh, Fulling and Janssen, for a nice presentation. I think we all have been um, eye-opened uh, by the possibilities, but also the challenges that leads ahead. And you also highlighted how the, the shifting consumer uh, behavior will definitely impact how we look at food. Uh, and uh, we touch also upon the the factors of uh, traceability in uh, in your presentation and also uh, along the chat here and uh, and how can you can you help uh, uh, answer uh, a question on how how you think uh, traceability will will play a key issue on circularity of uh, the industries going forward Evan, do you want to? I can comment on that because the, the question is uh, two ways. Is it traceability on regular consumer products, uh, the way that you can follow it from farm to fork, uh, mm -hmm. be it an aqua farm or be it a fishing boat to consumer? Uh, that's one question and that's something that is becoming mainstream and more or less uh, something that is required just as much as food safety is uh, a part of it still to be developed but the the other part on traceability is if you use uh, and, and think circular economy how to use food waste or uh, uh, use uh, off-grade food products that has been in a store who has which has been packaged how do you uh, process those foods? How does the reg uh, regulatory side meet the need for utilizing those products and how do you define them? And that opens a completely different challenge to traceability uh, for the circular economy in the food sector. Uh, traditionally, it's um, uh, so that if it enters as food, you can continue as that food. If it enters as waste, it stays as waste. And that uh, is something that uh, has to be sorted out. And that's why the regulatory side is an important part of the equation on future traceability. Mm. I, I follow you and it's, uh, it's obviously something that you can't do only on the company side. You need to work along with uh, um, the government and legislator uh, to to help uh, boost this uh, forward. Uh, we earlier touched also upon who was the leading ones uh, in order uh, to be country specific uh, in the chat here. What kind of uh, uh, countries were the, uh, were the leading ones in circular economy? And uh, Alexander, uh, you touch upon uh, Belgium and the Netherlands here. What what kind of issues are they um, attacking uh, when you say they are leading? Why why are they better than the other ones? 
Edward, sorry. Uh, yeah. Hi again. Hi again. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, can you see me? OK. Yeah, just some of the issues. So they've been really thinking about it, as as Ovin was saying, in their legislation as well. So they've been helping. They've been supporting uh, companies, but also the legislation in these countries, so Netherlands, Belgium, I know, know the case in Belgium very well. The legislation is really uh, in favor of circular economy, turning waste into resource, as you said, and not segmenting waste that always has to stay waste. I'll give you a concrete example. So, for instance, in Belgium, the waste uh, management agency recently uh, changed itself from being a waste management agency to being a circular agency to, to really promote circular economy. So if in the administration itself they can think more circular, how are we going to promote circular? How are we just going to see waste as a problem to seeing let's let's come up with solutions as a resource and help, you know, provide grants. Um, help industry remove barriers because a lot of the legislation is a barrier to, to circular solutions i think and that that would be some good things that the uh, norway could, could look at doing as well in line with other european countries yeah thank you and we we look forward to the circular economy uh, proposal that is uh, coming out from the the government this fall. Um, even uh, filling in uh, jansen just some roundup comments what do you think will We'll have the biggest growth in um, uh, in diversity to uh, in between circularity principle and this plant-based um, uh, lab-based food. Uh, how do you think when you you see the broad perspective of, of what kind of trend will will grow the most? I think that will grow in parallel, but. Uh, Certainly, uh, for the time being, the use of uh, plant-based food is uh, on a tremendous rise because it uh, has funding and financial backing, uh, mm -hmm. which is way overgoing what is being invested in food, uh, food waste management. Uh, so uh, my answer is, uh, first you will see plants and then you will see food waste. And an important part is that uh, if you look at food waste, uh, everybody thinks that you have to process this to something of higher value like nutraceuticals or whatever. But uh, just as important is that if you are able to utilize the proteins that are available and take out the proteins, the fats, the, uh, the minerals and so forth, uh, then you doesn't necessarily have to move towards small volumes, high value, but you can stay in the food uh, cycle as ingredients or uh, value added. And then um, protein based on insects where they are processing food waste. The questionable uh, there is if you will in the future have enough food waste uh, as f uh, feed source for making insects uh, circular solution to uh, food waste. Thank you. So uh, just to uh, uh, up sum your statement, we need to catch up in the circular economy to keep pace of the, the growth of plant base. Uh, and that's some of the motivation for, for running this uh, seminar also. And um, we hope to see you again at the webinar on Friday. We're going to go uh, the three next uh, webinar is already posted on, both on the chat, but also on the Internet. So we hope you will follow up and uh, register for for interaction session and the workshop uh, that is uh, left for October. Thank you for now. Thank you for uh, Maria, Advert, Rob, Alexander and Eivin for contributing. We are very happy to have you and thanks for the audience who are uh, participating. We'll see you again on Friday.